X Pac 12360. Featuring weekly news, insider commentary, and interviews with superstars, past and present from the world of pro wrestling. A new day is dawning for DX. And now, your host, Sean X Pac Wolfman. Welcome to Xbox 12360, everybody. I was just listening to the intro and thinking, and it's definitely not the first time I've thought this. And you all know that. We need to change that, son of a bitch. What a great preview. Yeah. Let's make it happen. <laughs> hey, welcome to the show, everybody. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about um, women's evolution a little bit and a little bit later on in the show we're going to be joined by dr tom pritchard and he's going to talk about uh he's going to talk about this new wrestling school that he's opening up with glenn jacobs amazing AKA, awesome you know glenn jacobs will it is. be in tennessee i'm pretty sure all right yeah cool yeah so yeah we're going to talk about um that and also there's some there's some interesting things that like i didn't even know about tom and i've known him for years so i'm just going to ask him about a couple of other things besides the wrestling school. Sweet. And actually, there's a couple little funny stories, too, that oh, I can't imbibe. Wait. Have, have imbibe. I've never heard anyone who involved. doesn't love Dr. Tom that's worked with him. I've heard yeah. so many amazing things about him. So Yeah, and uh, and so, you know, when he was the guy, he he ran the, the um, before the Performance Center, he ran the, the you know, developmental in, in Tampa, and... Uh, and they chose to part ways with him, and that was a huge mistake, in my opinion. They got rid of the wrong guy. So I don't know if we'll get into that with Tom, because we don't, you know, sometimes some things need to just be left alone. Uh, but that's my feelings on that. Yeah. Without naming names. So, all right, let's get into it. All right, well, as you guys know, this week, WWE held their first ever all-women's pay-per-view, Evolution. Um, before we get into each match, each each and every single match, I want to know, what was your guys' overall thoughts on the whole show itself? Qual Matt, like, quality-wise? Like, just, like, in general. Like, everyone's saying, like, this is one of the oh, best pay-per-views that there's been in a long oh, time, fantastic. and I agree, so I yeah. wanted to know what you thought. Yeah, fantastic show. And, yes, okay, when we get in... Into the you know into the details, yeah. I could pick apart a couple of things here and there. We can do that with any show, and we're going to because okay, what comes along with um, you know something like this is uh, the same type of criticism we would give the guys too, right? Sure. So let's. I mean, I think it's only fair that uh, the women are just as strong as the men these days, and uh, to me, I think they're better. A lot, you know, a lot of times. So uh, they can handle the criticism. I mean, just for me watching, <laughs> you just saw the focus yeah. and the look in every woman's eyes that was on that show. They knew how important it was to them. Yeah. And that was fun to watch. Start to finish, everyone brought it. And then the, some historic matches, I thought. Yeah, I think so, too. Honestly, I feel like it over-exceeded my expectations. But let's go ahead and start off. The first match was Trish and Lita defeated Mickey James and Alicia Fox, who that was originally supposed to be I mean, Alexa so, Bliss, but she replaced Alexa. Yeah, so uh, real quick, before that, like, were there in, was there any, like, pregame stuff that I missed out on that we need to talk about? There was just, like, the hype video to show the No like, matches, the though. Yeah, there okay. wasn't a pre-show match There was a red carpet. Yeah, okay, a red carpet. Yeah. Yeah. Which which Maria Menounos showed up on. Yeah. And, and Kathy Kelly and all, all, all of our favorites. Yeah. So, okay. And I was, and so Nate was there too. Nature Boy Ric Flair. Yeah. And I was just with him like a couple hours earlier in, uh, in San Antonio, oh, wow. Alamo City Comic Con. But, um, cool. So, yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure there was nothing we needed to. Uh, touch on before we got into the matches okay go ahead Didn't all right interrupt no worries so Trish Lita defeated Mickey James and Alicia Fox that was the first that was the opening match no. I don't know what you guys think about it I wouldn't have put it as the first match yeah really? no I thought it was kind of slow I understand why they do, and that's kind of why they it's probably they probably wanted to just you know give the fresh crowd to the ladies that might you know they might think oh well like maybe they they how do I say this? Well, they, like, they, miss might, two, they might so. miss a step or Yeah. Here I am saying, oh, they can handle the criticism. And I'm, I'm like, well, you know, just stepping on eggshells right? here. I, I, I think just, you know, you hit the music of, of Trish and Lita to kick off the show. That's going to yeah. make everyone really stoked. One of the biggest ovations of the here. night. 
Yeah. Why is it echoey in here? Uh, it's because of Jimbo. It's because Jimbo's mic. Yeah, well, we need to fix that. Yes, sir. He'll, he'll fix it and, and we'll, we'll keep right. going. So, honestly, one of the highlights for me was Mickey James and Trish Stratus. When they both of them got into the ring to square off against each other, yes. everybody, I felt it from watching at home, and I feel everybody in the audience felt it. There was a, a different, there was a shift in energies, mm. I think, because we yeah. all know their history. We all know what a memorable program those two women had. And to kind of see them now both going at it, and honestly, I feel that you... I feel like I'm a bigger Trish Stratus fan now than I was in the past, to be honest. Okay, cool. This just cements how great Mickey James is, too. I mean, she's still doing it after all these years and still is amazing. Mickey James is the MVP of that match for sure. Without she held doubt. that match together. She was the workhorse of that match. And maybe, like, honestly, as far as, like, value in their match goes and you know all the things i just said she might be the the one that like brought it the most the whole night like if we're taking you know i mean that's just how i look at it i mean i think she really stepped up and and uh and uh well just we're just talking about this particular match sure but i just thought she was fantastic she was and her longevity is unquestionable she's incredible. yes all right. Well, moving on, we had the 20 women battle royal with Nia Jax winning. Who did you guys think that she was actually going to be the one to win? And what did you think about all the women that came out? You know, we had so many. We had Kelly Kelly. There was just so much going on. I'm just, I'm just thinking about Ivory. Ivory was great. Yes. Oh, man, just the best. Ivory looked awesome. I, l I was... I don't remember what spot it was. There was some something where someone set someone on the top corner... And then didn't knock them out, and they just like left them sitting there, and then they got eliminated. I thought that was really weird. I loved Alondra Blaze wearing her original gear to the ring. Yeah, that was awesome. I was really hoping Selena Vega would win. Me too. Oh, no I thought that was such a perfect setup to just eliminate both the monsters in the battle royal and be like, "Yes, it's me." But, but I was really happy she, Nia Jax won. She had an incredible moment, did Zelina, along with the Iconics, kicked it off perfectly with on, on the mic. They were just amazingly entertaining. I was funny. under the impression that was go there was going to be more NXT representation. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know why, but I think that because they said that it was the past, present, and future of the industry and there was a lot of pictures from the NXT women's division, I thought we were going to have more representation, but I was surprised that we didn't. Hmm. Did we have enough, did they have enough uh, female talent? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, and I didn't, I, that just made me think of something. I, I was reading some complaints of, they announced 50 competitors, and there's only 38. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> did they really just oh, break them down and count yes. the people? Hell yes. That's how fucking petty people some people and i get it i do get it like yeah they did announce that and yeah like okay it would be nice if they stuck to their guns but like the person that is sitting there all night focused on that are you serious well, enjoy the goddamn show yeah it's not like if like if they had added the 50 women that that was going to make the show better or worse or whatever you know some people walk around life in general 24 hours seven days a week Looking for gotcha moments that they can get people, you know, like, up, oh, up, oh, see, oh, look at that person. You know, I mean, I can't even imagine walking through life like that every day, just looking for shit wrong with people. That's wrestling fans. Uh, not all of them, obviously, but that's a lot of them in 2018. And I get it. You want to, you want to recognize these things when they pop up, you know, I mean, that we have to, but like to actually just be focused on the bad shit. I don't, I don't understand how you can enjoy the good shit. What did you think of the moment when uh, Nia Jax tossed out Selena onto Tamina? Uh, some people were comparing that to Andre the Giant for WrestleMania II Battle Royal when he threw, um, he picked up Bret Hart and threw him onto uh, Jim on the floor. I didn't get that until it was actually, uh, the comparison was made. But oh, I went, okay. But I don't know if that was by design at all. But it was a, definitely a, a cool visual. And... Um, and I just, I, you know, I enjoyed the Battle Royal a lot. Something I thought it was lacking was when I in a Royal Rumble. I usually don't like them, you know. I, hate, I usually hate Battle Royal. Well, in Royal Rumbles, the, whoever comes in gets to hit all their cool stuff, and then it goes on until the next person comes in yeah. and hits all their cool stuff. But because this was a Battle Royal and they were all in the ring, I didn't think anyone got their moment in the ring to do, like, two cool moves and then move on. Next person does, like, two cool moves and then move on. 
That's right. yeah, that's not what battle royals are for. Unless you get down to like the final, you know, four or five people in the in the ring, you get you know, you clear clear the ring of everyone, you can get some shit done in there. Um but for the most part, you know, those are just throwaway matches. I'm sorry, like it's um in the past, you know, that would be the match that you put on for the big main event. Like Okay, everyone comes back out for the Battle Royal mm -hmm. and, you know, a $10,000 prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> moving on after that, we had the finals of the 2018 Mae Young Classic, which was Tony Storm who defeated Io Shirai. Yeah. And prior to, um, after this match, I thought, man, nothing is going to top this match. Mm -hmm. I mean, it eventually did. But I honestly, I love this match. I know a lot of people were complaining that this match was really short. But for what it was, I thought it was really good. Well, how long was it? It was like what, like ten minutes or so, something around that. I don't know the exact. Fun. I don't know yeah. the exact amount of times, but every. I mean, yes. Had they gone an additional like five or so minutes, this match would have been like, whoop. But you know, need to realize this is not the last time we're going to see these two go. I mean, Tony Storm is what twenty three yeah. years old. Io Shirai just got there. They both have long careers ahead of them. So let's just enjoy the process. Yeah, and they're, and also uh, when you're, you know, you have your place on the show, and we also have to understand that, and they did, and it was. It was really good, and I, I know I didn't actually know Tony was from Australia. I only I I used to just see her over in uh, the UK. Mm. Yeah, I think she. I think her boy. I think. Um, oh crap! The little guy, the the blonde hair kid. Spud. No, the the one the one that was the yeah, NXT UK champion. Now I'm having a oh, fucking Tyler brain fart. Yeah, I think they might be boyfriend or girlfriend and girlfriend, hmm. maybe. And That's I always seen them kind of, <laughs> always seen them kind of like you know talking to each other. And doesn't she do the same finish? It's a very similar finish. Yeah, yeah for sure. She does the tiger driver. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. I, I knew she was gonna win because when she set up for that, you could see her already starting to cry. Yeah. That was great. It was yeah. so, so emotional. Um, and I like the finish because, uh, you know, she went up for the moonsault and she put her feet up. She put her feet up. She just moved. She put her feet yeah. up and nailed. Yeah, put her, her you know, put her knees face. up. Yeah. Yeah. Like and the then beach. you and then went home right from there and that's how you do it like mm -hmm. sometimes they you you so many missed opportunities like when someone will miss something like that or someone will put the knees up and it's the perfect time for a near fall and people don't take it like i like i'll just go not pick on nick aldis but like twice in a row cody missed the moonsault and he didn't go for the cover in matches that's why well he still won the title though sure did yeah the second time not what to go off into the NWA thing, but... What I thought was cool about this match, too, is that everything that they did in the ring was clean. Everything uh -huh. was perfect. There yeah. wasn't any, like, you know... I want nothing to, say to take you out of the game. Right, nothing to kind of make me get out of it. No, yeah. the whole time, it was perfect, and I, I was just, like really happy that the way that they paced the match mm. out is that you know they didn't start off like super slow or super fast or anything like that they hyped up every every single part every single move that they hit it was there for a reason it was there i just thought that the way this match was laid out was absolutely perfect and i how do you pronounce it eo shirai. eo shirai yes she's a big star holy shit i'm watching her in there and i'm watching her ring presence and i'm watching her like tied tony storm up in holds and this big old shit eating grin on her face and she's just you know she's just owning it in there mm -hmm. she knows what's up she knows what the fuck to do in there she um you know the the, the stuff you do in between the moves she knows what to do so yeah, here's, we're going to see a lot more from her. Absolutely. Now, here's a question, though. So Tony Storm wins the Mae Young Classic. She's already part of the UK. She's going to be a regular part of NXT now as well, we can assume. NXT UK and NXT. Do we know? I, I don't know. I don't have any, any information on that. But I just feel, okay. do you think that they like she would have to have to be? like She her? wins the Mae Young Classic. I think people want to see her, but I, I guess there are Why not put her on their new flagship show, Wednesdays on the WWE Network? There you go. See? What show is that? NXT? NXT UK. Oh, UK. Yeah, so the NXT UK. I knew that. It's NXT UK, 205 Live, and then NXT US, I suppose. I knew they had a U NXT UK show on the network. Right. It, started like, it started like two weeks ago. And, and Mark, she's already a part of that. My point is, will she also be regularly seen on NXT as well? Uh, I don't know. Okay. 
All right. Well, moving on after this match, we had the six women. It was Natalia Bailey and Sasha Banks who defeated the Riot Squad. Mm -hmm. I love the Halloween themed gear for all of the Riot Squad. That was really cool. And I thought they worked great together, like always. I always love when uh, official tag teams are killing it. And even with uh, Sasha and Bailey having, like, there was one point where uh, Sasha did the, the backstabber and popped someone up, and Bailey caught her in the belly belly to belly which that is was really nice. great that was a great mm -hmm. sequence i love mm -hmm. i love tag tag matches where tag teams are doing like consecutive moves and working together but. and i really enjoyed Liv morgan as an antagonist i think she's just i loved her as, at starting out this match yeah fantastic mm -hmm. yeah wasn't there like some spot where they all ended up in the middle of the ring and then they all kind of gravitated towards the outside for something else to happen you know what i'm talking about I'm just Boy. thinking of her red tongue. That's all I can Boy, say. Boy, whoever right, sounds right. stupid and right I, now. I enjoyed the heart attack as well. <laughs> yeah. Cool paying homage to that as well. So. Yeah, that was great. Right. Awesome. So then after that, we had the NXT Women's Championship match, which was Shayna Baszler, who defeated Kyrie Sane to become the new champion. Mm -hmm. What did you guys think of this one? I think this is just a big setup for the four horsemen and coming together and doing some damage in NXT or WWE. Including Ronda, you're saying? Oh, yeah, all of them. I think the cool thing about that, it, about this one in particular, is that now that Shayna as champion, I think she's going to be such a good heel. And then having, now she can have a program with Kairi Sane. She can have one with Io Shirai. And both of those we know yeah. are going to be very good. So I feel that her being the champion opens up a lot of options. Yeah. Has anyone noticed that um, that Shayna's style has, uh, has uh, uh, she's adapted to the actual pro wrestling style a little bit more. It's like there's a little bit more rope work going on mm -hmm. in, in her matches. and She's incredible. Yeah, I mean, she's great. I think when all is said and done, a lot of people are surprised she's winning again because she's, you know, oh, she's going to go up. But she could be end up being the best NXT Women's Champion of all time by the time the second run is done. You know, there haven't been, have there been any two-time champions yet? I think she might be the first one. Now, Asuka took a lot of time being the longest reigning champion. Right, but right. in terms of, like, like Actual reigns? No, this is I important act, for a different reason. I actually look f f pretty far down the road, and I see some big money to be made. Shayna Baszler versus Ronda Rousey. Oh, sure. Yeah. For, far down the road, but both, like, you know, she's, you know, both of them need more experience to be in there with each other in a huge match like that, uh, you know. Um, so, yeah, because like, usually you need someone, like one, one of the two people needs a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. But I still I can see them going out there and being being able to do it. And credit to Kyrie yeah. saying she is fearless. I mean, the stuff that that went on during that match was. And she's so was... much smaller than Shayna yet. Like you still like believed you know that you know that that she was a credible opponent. Yep. I just I I, I think they've done a, a masterful job of telling the story over the course of what's it been a year since that May Young Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Over a year. Yeah. That crossbody to the outside, though. Oh, Lord. Oh, man. Perfect. So crazy. Yeah. Imagine if she would have hit an elbow like that. What really got me is when Shayna had her dangling by her left shoulder from over. I mean, just I was cringing just watching that. And and commentary did an amazing job of, of also reiterating those feelings for the audience. Did anyone see the post-fight, the post-match interview with uh, Shayna and then... Like Kyrie Kelly Sane comes there. like is like you can hear her crying in the background, and then they like pan over to her and no. you know there was some interaction between the two. What is that? A, was that a WWE.com exclusive? Yeah, oh, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Got it's it. Got media. it. Oh, there you go. Well, the next match, this is the one that everyone is talking about. This is what some people are saying was one of the matches of the year. And it was the last woman standing match for the SmackDown Women's Championship, Becky Lynch defeating Charlotte Flair. I mean, I'm sure you guys can go on and on about this one because it was incredible. Yeah, it was, yeah, that was obviously the best match of the night. Obviously. And... Um, it was it was bound to be. I mean, they just have all the tools. Uh, like the, what I mean by tool, like all like last woman standing match. That's a hell of a uh, like. It's like okay, I could use tables. I could use like you could do anything in that, mm -hmm. anything, and and 
they have the hottest story in WWE, period. Not just the ladies. I'm talking about they have the hottest angle in the company right Without now. Without question. And, unless so. you want to count Gargano and Champa still. But, yeah, yes. you're right. Absolutely. But, yeah. see, this one was different because this one literally tore fans apart in mm -hmm. terms of, oh, we don't like Becky Lynch as a heel. All we want her as a face. Face, heel, face, heel. Whatever. What are we doing to Charlotte? I feel that this one caused a lot of uh, controversy amongst wrestling Twitter. And I feel that that added to this match because uh -huh. you knew that yep. going in. Even when, okay, when Charlotte came out, like, she didn't get the normal Charlotte, you know, the, the normal Charlotte pop that she normally gets. No, it was a mixed reaction. And and then when and they were oh and remember when she was out there everybody was already chanting Becky mm -hmm. so you're thinking like oh man Charlotte Charlotte is getting the Roman Reigns treatment now and you know then Becky comes out and I feel like all of that energy that the fans had added to this and at one point you're thinking like you know they better not have uh, Charlotte win this match because that's not going to do any favors for Becky Lynch so I just feel that the way this whole this match the way the whole thing played out not one time did I think oh I should send a tweet out why because my brain was enthralled with yeah. everything that they were doing the yes. way that the story was moving along and everything that they were doing with the chairs with the stuff on during the commentary and then <laughs> and then afterwards when Charlotte went through the table I mean it was absolutely crazy yeah so like the the, the thing about these kind of matches is um, the false finishes that you would and the near falls and all of those like moments that you would have in a normal match, uh, it's way different because it's all like the false finish is a 10 count. Sure. And it takes a long time to get, you know, one, you know, the whole drama and the referee, one, two, you know, um, and, and all that. So it's a different kind of false finish. And uh, uh, I think they, I, especially at the end, I really just thought that they did them so well. Mm -hmm. So well. Uh, Charlotte was phenomenal. I, I was just about to say, nobody, for me at least, nobody screams in agony like Charlotte. I mean, you felt everything she went through. And she's not, she sounds awful when she screams yeah. she sounds like someone would be if you're going through tables if you're being buried by all types of things i mean just the subtleties like that are just uh, everything about it man i feel like she sells like rick flair yeah. for oh, sure god kudos ladies <laughs> actually yeah she yeah. does <laughs> uh so anyway we're you know this match was um there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of people mad because this match wasn't on last and I understand that. I do. Sure. However, the, the right match went on last. And I, I put a tweet out about it. And I didn't really name names or anything, but I just said if you're going to position a woman to headline WrestleMania, she needs to be headlining other pay-per-views. And, you know, I had people... You know, and and I put there's not too many shopping days left till Christmas. <laughs> I saw that. Christmas yeah, yeah. is WrestleMania. Sure. And um, and so we need to have Ronda predominantly featured in the main events, especially of the women's pay per view. Okay. And um, and and make no mistake about it, she is like the woman that's going to be. Uh, I mean, People could go, oh, yeah, but, you know, between now and then, you know, back here, this. No. The main, like, the huge star that's going to uh, get all the mainstream publicity needed for something like this is Ronda Rousey. Mm. That's, I mean, there's no two ways about it. Granted, even though Becky and Charlotte put on a main event, main event level match, your point is, yeah, Ronda's and, the money. And those two ladies, Nikki, Be well, three ladies, Nikki and Bree, because it was really t one on two, you know, mm -hmm. two on one, one on two. Uh, uh, they went out there and followed it in spectacular fashion. They didn't top that match, but they had a hell of a match themselves. The people were into it the whole time. They bought the finish. Everything worked. Yeah. It so did. it's not like they went out there and bombed after, you know, and couldn't follow it. And we're like, oh, you know, and the people were shitting on it. The people were into it all the way. People should be happy they had a hell of a double main event. And that's, that's incredible thing. that they were able to follow that match 
right afterwards. Usually there's a buffer in between a match like that and the main event. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel your reasoning for Ronda being in the main event and Ronda and Nikki being the main event is also the same sort of argument that people were having as to why Nikki Bella was even facing Ronda Rousey to begin with. Because, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, we don't want Nikki to face Ronda, whatever, you know. So I feel that the same reasoning as to why Nikki Bella was in that match is the same reasoning as to why those two were the main event. You know, and I feel like we've seen this a lot, even with the men. How many times didn't you say, oh, I wish so-and-so would have been the main event, but no, instead we had so-and-so, you yeah. know? So it, they it's, do it it's in repeated. UFC, too. It happened because UFC doesn't really follow the ratings. I mean, they have ratings, but, like, they just make the matches they think are the marquee matches to make mm -hmm. money. So I mean, look uh, at when Punk fought. He was a pretty good position on the card the first time. Oh, oh somebody cheer that. Did you read that stuff about Tyrone Woodley getting on Joe Rogan shit? Mm -mm. Saying, hey, cut it out with the fucking with uh, CM Punk. You got smoke with him. You got problem with me, too. Enough of this shit. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sticking up. Because he has been going in kind of hard on on uh, on Punk. Well, Rogan's made it clear. Because he's, he's talking about Jay, uh, Logan Paul, and Logan Paul is way better than CM Punk. What? Okay. Well, didn't we learn the first time? Well, Rogan's very clear. He's always been. He's not a wrestling fan. He's made fun of wrestling for years. And so he looks at Punk as a pro wrestler obviously try and so i could see i'm not surprised let's put it that way so do we want to add anything else to ronda rousey and nikki bella since that's the one we kind of talked about it but i don't know if you guys want to add anything else on this match that, that was great that finish was amazing Oof. yeah that rolling arm bar off the top rope was insane and props to nikki for taking it and it was from from the beginning to the very end everything like okay so Certain things might not have been smooth, like the, the execution. Um, but when you have two women on your fucking shoulders, like sometimes, oh like God. you know, it might not go. Like when you're doing, when you're doing that reverse inverted Samoan drop thingy. Still. I know there's a ju judo name for it, Japanese name, but can't can't pull it out of my ass right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. From start to finish, this match. Um, it was laid out so well and everything worked and and it was just like i'm watching this thing unfold and i'm going oh so good perfect spot right there so like i'm not i want like i'm wondering who helped them out with that match well it goes actually. back to what you said i remember months ago the first time you saw ronda rousey is she does things it takes some people 10 years to learn and yep. she continues to prove that yeah Actually, my last question to you is going back to the Becky and Charlotte match. Do yeah. you think that Becky Lynch is going to hold the title for a few months now, or are we seeing a short reign in her future? Mm. I sure hope she keeps I, it. I could see it. I can. Whew. They better just leave that on her for a minute. Um, and, okay, so. You, you remember when I was talking about when Becky first started blowing up here, like mm -hmm. a few weeks, a few months ago? Or, you know, I was talking about her, and I'm like, don't get, you know, too caught up in the idea that it's going to be Charlotte versus Ronda. Right. Well, I, I've heard Scuttle, I've heard Scuttle, but, you well, know. Well, we're getting at Survivor Series, they do a lot of champion versus championship mas matches, and they've announced that it's going to be Ronda versus yeah. Becky at Survivor Series. There you go. Not in a singles match. In a singles match. In a singles? Yeah. No, I heard, I read it was a. Survivor Series team match. Okay, maybe there's still time for the match to change, but they they announced it as that. Already. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I That's would... fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. That's the only match announced so far. Jesus Christ. That's a WrestleMania match. I wouldn't do that at Survivor. Series. That's just stupid. I'm sorry. I and I don't care like who who hears that and gets mad. That's fucking stupid. That's a match down the road like that. that, that talk about a waste. Oh my God. Well, overall, honestly, I feel that for those that either decided not to watch WWE Evolution, for those that decided to skip it because maybe they didn't think it was going to be as great or whatever, because there were a lot of people that did think that. Really? I, yeah. Hmm. Trust me, there were some All people right. on my Twitter saying, like, wait, people are actually watching this? And I was like, what? Yeah. Why not? Yes. I, start to finish. It was phenomenal. Like, kudos to everyone. Hey, so are you kidding me? Can we talk about... Uh, uh, all right. Real quick before we go and bring uh, come back with Dr. Tom. Uh, <clears throat> no guard, no normal, like, uh, you know, the big guardrails that they have at TVs and pay-per-views. It was just the ring. Uh, it was the, just like the, the house show ones? Yeah, it was just the guardrails. Mm -hmm. And no lights. 
Um, and uh, at first I'm just like, you know, that's kind of shitty. And this looks like a house show, you know, with a goddamn Titan Tron in the back. And um, I'm not going to lie, I kind of was kind of shitty. But it, I liked it. In spite of, like, okay, we're just going to give them that. Like, I liked it. I thought it looked, I liked the, the look of the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. And I would like to see more uh, done like that. Really? Because I yeah. thought at first when I started, I was like, oh, this is weird. I'm not used to seeing WWE right. like this. Yeah. It took a really long time to adjust. But by the end of it, I wasn't thinking about it anymore. So maybe yeah. that's what sort of happened. But I will tell you, it took some time to get used to. At least for me, it was to watch it on TV like that. And there was some kind like of an odd, you know, and since people were not afraid to give you know, the NWA 70 shit over the audio in the beginning. There was audio problems on this show. There sure were, yeah. Right off the, out of the box. Mic's off. And like, I could hear somebody saying, hey, your mic's not working, right before the uh, Anita Strauss came on. Yep. And um, and NWA did fix all the audio issues. You could rewatch yeah. it now, and it's all taken care yeah, of. Yeah, that shit happens when you're doing a live uh, broadcast. Yes, and they did. They fixed all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you go back and watch N- NWA 70 on Fight TV now, it's like all the audio is fixed. Which didn't take me, like, I still love the show anyways, yeah. talking about NWA 70. That was fantastic. So, um, anyway, yeah. Oh, shit, what else was I going to say? Um, oh, God damn it. My mind's so all over the f- place sometimes. When you're talking about the staging, how it was like a house show, yeah. lighting, stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, and so... Did it sell? Did the show sell out? They said it was. It looked pretty packed. I heard they didn't. But yeah, I but I mean, <laughs> okay, but was the building full? It looked like it on television. They, I, they specifically said, "Welcome to a sold-out Nassau Coliseum." Mm. So, must be true. There you go. Mm. All right. Anything else we want to talk about? I think we're ready for Doctor Tom. Yeah. yeah. We want to take a break right now. We're going to come back with Doctor Tom Pritchard. Welcome back to X Pac One Two Three Sixty, everyone. Join us over the phone right now from the beautiful city of Knoxville, Tennessee. I've known this guy for a long time. Had some great matches with him, and uh, has been around and and done some cool things I didn't even realize. And I think I know a lot about wrestling. Anyways, um, welcome to the show, everyone. Dr. Tom Pritchard. Yeah. yeah. John, thank you very much for having me today, man. It's an extreme pleasure. Thank, hey, man, I, w- I had been thinking of you recently, Tom, and it was so cool when I got your message. I was like, yes, how about tomorrow? Right. You know, I was so cool. It was it was really cool because there's so much to talk about. Uh, uh, obviously, we're going to get into uh, the, you know, the, the school that, uh, that you and Glenn are, are starting there in Knoxville. What a great place, too. Have you ever been to Knoxville? Never been to Knoxville. It's it's one of the most beautiful places there is. Period. I went there for the 1980 World's Fair, and you know I was telling Tom, you know my great 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 grandfather is T- John Sevier. He was the first governor of Tennessee. Anyways, whatever. Um, but Tom, I I was I was doing just a, a, a bit of research, and I didn't realize that you started out here in L.A. and working for the LaBelles. Oh yeah. Yeah, wow, was, uh, man. here's the funny thing about that. Um, you know, I started, I had my first match on October 20th, 1979, and uh, Boyd Pierce was the announcer in Houston. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, oh, so he so did Boyd Houston, he booked. did, he did Houston huh? and, he did Houston and Mid- Mid-South, huh? And Mid-South, yeah. Oh, wow. He would drive after every Friday night, he would drive from uh, Houston to Shreveport doing right. TV and uh, then whatever else was going on. So uh, I had my first match in Bryan, Texas, and then I think the next the next week or something, Boyd asked me if I wanted to come and do TV in Shreveport, and I got Paul Bosch's blessing, and yeah. we drove all night long. Anyway, I started so I wrestled around there for a little bit, and then I was Paul had got me booked to go to Portland, Oregon, um, in January 1980, and Gary Hart came to me the night uh, my last night in Houston, and said. Um, you're going to go to L.A. first. Uh, and I said, well, Paul's got me booked in Portland. He goes, well, you go to L.A. first, and then you go to Portland. I said, okay. Well, I didn't really know how it worked. I just thought everybody was communicating with everybody else, you know, and I was I was green and just uh, yeah. enamored being in the business. And I thought, well, they got it covered. So 
Uh, I flew out to Fresno, California for my first match. That's where I met Piper the first time, and uh, and that was a trip in itself. And then drove back to L.A. and started working for uh, Michael Bell, and yeah. Chavo Guerrero was a booker. And after about two weeks, I asked Chavo, I said, hey, uh, when am I supposed to go to Portland? And he said, oh, you're not, man. You're here. You're going to work here for a while. Oh, wow. I said, oh, wow. okay. I didn't think to call anybody or anything like that, so I just kind of hung out and stayed, <laughs> and I would talk to you know, my brother occasionally, I talked to some people, but I mean, I just never, I never gave it a thought because I was having a blast mm. in LA. And at 20 years old, back in 1980, I mean, it was a different city, you know, than it is now, I think. And uh, so I, I just enjoyed the living the hell out of myself. The Olympic Auditorium back then was, uh, they called it the Madison Square Garden of the West Coast. And it was just that cool, old style wrestling building, man. It was, um, uh, it was cool as hell. I got my first trip to Japan, worked with Fujinami there and uh, L.A., and, and just, uh, I had a blast. Who was your first match in, in here in L.A.? Oh, I'm trying to, I think I worked, man, it was in Fresno. Actually, my first match in California was in Fresno. I flew to Fresno. And yeah, I, but uh, once, you, uh, once you got, like, how was the Olympic, though? The Olympic, how was it? Yeah. It, it was it was one of the coolest buildings I've ever been in, man, because it had the underground, like you'd take a few steps down to go to the yeah. dressing room. And those are the dressing rooms in Pulp Fiction, you know, after the boxing sure. match. Oh, wow. and, and Travolta and, and uh, the other guys walking down the, the dressing room. That's, that's the Olympic Auditorium, man. So many cool, cool things. So many cool TV show episodes. So many cool movies have used that venue and, 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 the, back, and, and in the backstage area and all that stuff. So, like... Yeah, I'm familiar with how it looks. I just, man, that must have been really cool, huh? It, it was really cool, man. I met Dr. Jerry Graham my first night yeah. in there, and he was sitting in the first little dressing room, drunk as hell. And uh, but he, but he's really, really a cool guy. Really, really nice guy. And uh, asked me where I was from, and and I told him I worked for Paul Bosch. And um, I don't remember the stories he told me, but I remember how he was into it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah, so it was uh, it was a very very cool thing, man. How about Jimmy Lennon? Did you get to rub? Did you get to talk to Jimmy Lennon? <laughs> yeah, at all? Jimmy Jimmy Lennon was a he was he was one of those cool guys, you know. That I don't know if you would think of him that way or not. Yeah. But he really was one of the boys. He introduced me to his niece, you know. Parentheses niece. Right. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? He yeah. was one of the boys. It was great. It was that kind of vibe. Man. Gotcha. It was, it was it was the old school vibe, and I was, like I said, I was 20 years old, just soaking it all in, and and it was uh, Hollywood and and the beach and and uh, whatever whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted it. Right. And how about how was I business? Say, business wasn't business wasn't that great. Yeah. I know. Uh, but. But it was fun because when I would when I would look at um, at like video clips like even recently like I've gone back and found like stuff from you know TV at the Olympic it didn't look that full at all in there, Tom. No, nah, no, nah, the eighties especially, man. But but it had that aura and it had that right. huge ring and huge. Uh, and you still had some guys coming in. I mean, the funks were still coming in. You had guys stopping from. Uh, you know, from Japan, they would stop there for a couple of days and they'd work a couple of shows for Mike. But, uh, yeah, I think it was on its down, downside. So they probably a lot of started going downhill about 75 or 76, yeah. something like that. Hey, did you ever make it to Portland, uh, before the late eighties? <laughs> I was there in 85. Yeah. I stayed at the bomber and, and, yeah. and lived out that, uh, that whole deal too, man. And that was pretty cool. And every every story you've heard about uh, somebody putting Elton cigar in their in their El butt. Elton <laughs> Owen. Yeah, I've seen it. That would be that's Elton Owen is 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 one of Don Owen's sons, right? No, no, he's his, he's oh, his brother. That's his brother. Yeah. No, but yeah. yeah Barry was his son. Hmm. Oh, Barry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Barry was his son. But Elton Elton ran uh, Eugene and a couple other spot shows and. Uh, Matt Bourne, every opportunity he had, man, I, I wouldn't believe it if you told me the story. Yeah. Because I think, how stupid can you be to leave the scar on a on a, on a a bench, you know, <laughs> high school with a bunch of wrestlers? Yeah. You know, how stupid can you be? Yeah. Or how drunk, you know, or both. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, that reminds me of the Brian Knobs taking uh, uh, Colonel Parker's cigar and sh- stuck it uh, up his asshole. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I wouldn't. Have, yeah, it's the same kind of deal. Yeah, you same know? thing. Yeah, pretty much. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> More ways than one. <laughs> so, what was it like working with Jim Cornette and, Smo- and Smoky Mountain Wrestling? I'm sorry. What was it like working with Jim Cornette? Uh, you know what? I always got along. I always got along with Jim because I've known Jim, gosh, kind of from wow, almost almost forty years now, I guess. And uh, he he's he's always been good to me. He's he can be a little excitable at times, and he can he can say things that rub people wrong. But uh, I judge people by the way they treated me, and he always treated me right. He gave me an opportunity when there were no opportunities available in the business. You know, called right. me up. And I, I'd been in Memphis for like a year and a half. And I, I mean, your shelf, your shelf life, especially in Memphis, is maybe three months. Yeah. You know, so I was I was kind of sitting there doing nothing. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm starting this territory in Knoxville. And uh, I want to put you and Stan together as a team because Bobby still had a contract with WCW. His plan originally was to bring the Rock and Roll Express and Midnight Express yep. in Knoxville and just recreate it. But Anyway, it gave me an opportunity. So I mean, uh, I can't I can't say anything, but I have love, respect, and uh, uh, admiration for Jim Cornette. I love that. I love work. Like I didn't get obviously, you know, the heavenly bodies that I worked with was you and Jig, you and uh, Jimmy, you know, Dry, Jimmy right. Del Rey. Jigolo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and hey, you know, this reminds me of a story, and I might as well tell it because, goddamn, your brother told one about. Um, about a rib that was played on on Jerry Jarrett with his shit getting locked into the uh, his Halliburton briefcase getting locked to a um, to a table in the in the in the venue that was bolted to the floor and anyway Jerry apparently got upset right. and called the cops but I used to be a little <laughs> shit like that man and one time I I I tied a cable through through Cornette's like jacket and everything and then. <laughs> You know, and then yeah. I locked it to something, and it was at, it was at Westchester. It was at White Plains in that building where, it, like, and you guys had, you guys were dressing all the way up at the very top floor, and right. and I came up to, to to admire my my handiwork, and I caught you guys like trying to get the, uh, get the thing undone, and and like I totally busted, my totally stooged on myself, and you guys knew I totally did it. <laughs> Well, wait. I think I think I think yeah, on that story. I think Cornette kind of blamed Del Rey. It was me. <laughs> yeah, but, but Cornette did blame Del Rey, and that's why he was we were trying to get it off. Yeah, you've he, got hot at Jimmy because Jimmy had been trying to rib him um, along the way, gotcha. and, and I think he thought this was just a deal. And and because I, I, I don't think that I don't think we would have tried to get it undone for any other reason. I think he blamed Jimmy on that mm. one. Man, if I recall, boy, yeah, no one, God, man, I was such an asshole at one time, Tom. <laughs> well, you know what, though, hey, but but you gotta you gotta say this about that, and this is the way I kind of I kind of equate those days. It's, it was like being in a in a constant hurricane or being yeah. at sea, and you know you have your good days and and sunshine and fun and all that stuff. Then you have those stormy days and stormy weeks and sometimes stormy months that never end. And you don't know what to do except cause havoc and even more havoc. Yeah, it just gets created yeah, in the it's, process, man. Yeah, because there was there was insanity everywhere you turn, man. I mean, I yeah, I look back at all that stuff, and you know, I wasn't exactly the most sociable <laughs> social butterfly there was. I was a uh, complete asshole myself, but I had other reasons for that too. I was trying to stay out of trouble, and you know, when you start try to stay out of trouble, you're gonna find even more trouble. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that happened to me because I'd lock myself yeah. in my room and just whew, that was bad. But it was good, so I lived through it. There we go. <laughs> right? Hey, so tell, can we talk right. about the differences in uh, in uh, the heavenly bodies when Stan and, and uh, was in, in it and when uh, Del Rey was in it? Well, you know what? Yeah. Um, because they both bring Stan, they I, both I bring really different things to the table because. Dan was uh, more laid back, and and you know when I when I would go out, and I, and I used to go out a lot more than I did when I went up to 
WWF at the time. Right. But, you know, when we would go out somewhere, Stan knew how to just, I mean, it was his style. It was kind of my style. I didn't want to make a whole lot, bring a whole lot of attention to what I was doing because chances are I had already uh, uh, partook before I got in the bar. <laughs> and I just want to kind of chill for a little bit and take in the whole scene right. and see what was going on. You know, I, I wasn't looking for fights. I was looking for yes. for a good time. Right. Yeah. And um, with Jimmy, and I, and I love Stan. Stan was great, great to be in the ring. He was easy to get along with, no problems ever. Jimmy, I, I love too. He was great in the ring. Um, hadn't can't say a thing about his work because he was fantastic. Excellent. But outside the ring, you know. I just remember going with him to a bar one night, and um, gosh, almighty, there, there was somebody who pissed him off. Some girl pissed him off or some shit, and he's telling me, "I want to piss in that bitch's purse. I want to piss in that bitch's purse." That's All true shit. He pissed in the bitch's purse, mm -hmm. and you know, there was a couple other times, and then, <laughs> you know, just things were finally. I said, "Jimmy, you're on your own, man." Yeah, and uh, that was all. I mean, th that was a difference. I mean, we we I, I kind of got to the point where, uh, yeah, it it just got to the point where, where sure. he went his way and I went mine. We met up at the arena, we did our job, and and that's what happened. And you can't do it if you're going to be successful like that. You got to if you're going to have a partner, you got to be partners all the yeah. way around. And I just didn't feel that. So, but he was real like. <laughs> If if you could switch out like okay how Stan acted outside the ring with with Jimmy like switch those things yeah. around like Jimmy would have been like ideal right I mean because he was great in the ring oh, I, I love working so. with and, you and guys nothing, listen man it, it, it wasn't him it was all just me I just didn't you know you got to understand I had uh, I had issues going in and so I didn't need anybody to shine the light on me. <laughs> me I yeah. Somewhere. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and everywhere we went, like, hey, here we are, boys. And it's like, no, dude, mm -hmm. let's, let's kind of sit down first because I need because I need to sit down. Right. You know. And brother, it was because people were looking at me sometimes, and I remember a couple times I got the lecture. You know, don't be in the bar like that, man. And I said, oh God, well if you're gonna do that, go to your room. I said, oh okay. Who'd you, so you get the lecture tomorrow. from, your brother? Huh? Who'd you get the lecture from? Um. There was a couple office people, okay. and I don't want to mention any names, right. but um, one in particular who happens to be related to me. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, because it was, it was, there was, there was a time, man, um, gosh, I mean, we could tell stories all day long, but you know when the liquid was going around? Oh, the, the GHB. Yes, yeah. brother, and I, I, I remember I went with, with, Michael Michael Hayes and I went out one time. He picked me up from the airport, and he had he had his wife at that time with him, Lori, and we yeah. went to eat. I forget what town it was. I just remember that I kept dropping the glass <laughs> at the bar. I kept dropping the glass, and, and it was beer. And then I started ordering mixed drinks, and he says, man, we need to sit down at the table. Well, somehow I dropped the glass <laughs> at the table, too. So, so it was moments like that. that yeah. People started saying, you know, I think you need to uh, stop that. And and it was like, but you know, did. and it wasn't like it was just you, you know. No, I mean, that's it, what I'm saying. There was me. That, there was see, there was. I was I was in a different spot yeah. because I wasn't in that spot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Hmm. Hey, how was money? Like, how was money when you uh, when you guys came to work for events there? You know, when you were still at Smoky Mountain. Uh, the money with Vince? Or? Yeah, with Vince. Yeah. Well, listen, man. Again, we're we're down in Tennessee working, and right. all of a sudden we come to the big city, and we get a check for like nine hundred bucks. We're like, hell yeah! Right. So uh, we couldn't complain, I mean, but you know, back then, you got to realize too, you were still doing high school gyms, you were still doing uh, small venues and things like that. So uh, that was right before, like, we got there in '93. Yeah, and then we did. We did SummerSlam, and then we did a Survivor Series. And I think we started full time in '94, so that was right before the attitude and everything really hit. So I mean, it wasn't great by any means. It was, it was really great. tough, actually. Like for like, you know, that business was on its ass uh, when you guys came in, and uh, right, and that's that's why I was asking what the what you know compared to, you know, Smoky Mountain. Well, com yeah, 
compared to anywhere else, I mean, yeah, we were making a decent check, you know, for, for us too. And yeah. we didn't really, uh, uh, you know, our habits were our habits, but it wasn't, it wasn't outrageous yet. Yeah. Were you guys uh, no, healing rooms? It, you... no, it was outrageous because there was people were sharing too. So. Sure. Yeah. There's always someone yeah. around that, that's not, that doesn't mind sharing as long as they can hang out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that was the culture back then too, you know? Mm. Go ahead. What what was your experience like working with the Iron Sheik while training with him? Excuse me. Well, um, well, I worked with him too a few times, but you got to remember, I did that when I was uh, sixteen, and that was also back when the guys were still trying to protect the business. And and the first time he tried to show, it was me and a football player, and I was working in the office for Paul Bosch, and I always used to ring my gear all the time just in case there ever came an opportunity like this. And it just happened to be that some guy used to play pro football, couldn't even tell you his name, couldn't tell you who he played for. But he contacted Paul, wanted to uh, learn how to wrestle. So Gary Hart would come in from Dallas every Friday afternoon and go over the matches with Paul. He brought the Iron Sheik with him. He was wrestling as Muhammad Farouk back then. And uh, uh, the football player came down to the office and Paul – said if you want to go with him go with him you can take him to the coliseum and you can train with him so i said great and so now i'm getting i got my bag and we're going to the sam houston coliseum dressing room you know i mean i i wouldn't get to go in there very much you know just just uh bring the contracts in or bring something in and leave right away because everybody was kayfabe well now we're we're sitting in there and you know cosro puts on his uh Olympic singlet and his Olympic boots and I'm looking like oh Christ <laughs> and we get in the ring and uh, I think I think the first thing he did was uh, want us to get on all fours and uh, or he got on all fours and he wanted me to try, try to break him down over, yeah and he wouldn't yeah so then he says now I do it to you and he got me on all fours and he stretched the living hell out oh my god and he did it to the football player and then we did that for a little bit. And then he showed us some sit-out stuff. But the thing that really got him pissed was he was trying to show us how to lock up. And, uh, you know, you put your left hand, it's collar. And you collar and right elbow. And his elbow. Yeah. Sure. So I slapped the shit out of him on the ear. And he slapped me right back. And it was uh, it was like that for about three weeks, four weeks, I guess. Mm. The football player quit after the second week because he said, the hell with this. I thought it was work. Huh. So, Yeah. Hey, so it's going to be easy. When I when I when I came up and and so I was trained by by uh, Boris Malenko, Larry Simon, and he right. there was there was no one that he talked more highly of than Paul Bosch. They made some money together. He came in, you know, he did this program, you know, Mr. Houston and you know under Matt. Anyways, he said Paul Bosch was the most well loved promoter in the business that he loved. He loved being able to give the first match guys like a hundred bucks or, or and a hundred bucks was a big payoff at one point. Sure. Yeah. Right. And and just I never heard one bad word. Booker T says the same thing about him. One bad well Booker T has the ring. Right. That came from Paul Bosch. Right, exactly. That's, yeah. So Yeah. No, and Paul Paul was like that. Um but you know about Malenko, let me just say this too real quick. Uh I, I got to see Wahoo and Malenko oh, yeah. uh, with his with Lord Charles Montague, Montague. His manager. Hans Mortier. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 all those those matches, man, and watching as a kid and seeing it live in the smoky Coliseum and and just the ring lights down, that was uh that was what made my my childhood about wrestling. And I got to tell uh Malenko that too at Paul's retirement. I said oh, cool. I just want to let you know I I watched you and Wahoo growing up, and you guys really made me want to be a wrestler, man. It was fantastic because they were real. Sure, everything they did in the ring was real, man. It was, it was they felt it, and that's, and and that's what that's what a lot of uh, a lot of is missing today. I think too is that feeling and going in there like those guys did, and they they believed it when they walked into the arena. So and Malenko was, and and Terry Funk will say that's like one of the greatest promo guys, one of the just greatest you know, guys on the mic that there ever was. Yeah. And it, it was surprising me because he had such a great uh, Russian accent. Yeah. He could do the eye. And, the eye, the Google it, eye, it, yeah. Know, the, 
yeah, the first time I saw, again, Wahoo knock the teeth out of his mouth, you know, yeah, you're in shock because that's not supposed to happen. And yeah. you learn about Eddie Graham doing it and all these other guys doing it in different territories. I thought, that's great because nobody expects that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. So. You yeah. had such an incredibly long career in the ring, and now you're one of the most well-respected, well-credentialed, well-loved trainers in professional wrestling. A lot of la other professional athletes, you hear them say, early on in my career, I knew I wanted to transition into coaching. Is that how it was for you, or is it something you gradually just figured out that you could be really great at um, towards the end of your in-ring career? No, I, I believe it was just being at the right place at the right time, and the opportunity was, was there. And uh, I, was, I, I had gone when I came home uh, to Houston on occasion. I would go to... Uh, Tug Taylor had a gym, had a, had a ring set up someplace. And Tiger Conway yeah. Jr. called me one day and says, hey, man, why don't you come over here and work out with the guys? And I thought, oh, man, I don't, I don't know if I want to get hurt or not. So I went in, and I saw these guys taking taking each over in a headlock. I mean, just bearing down and just landing on each other's heads mm -hmm. and, and all over the place. I said, guys, can I just show you something? It's a lot easier if you just do this. And I stepped through and put my hip – into it went down on a knee and i showed him just do that and so bruce actually bruce came with us and he had told vince about that and so for some reason again just being at the right place at the right time uh i guess 96 they were starting mark henry was just signed uh akam albrecht yep was, they, they signed him too and uh dwayne johnson they signed mm -hmm. him too so he had already been in memphis for a little bit and they were going to bring him in and get him ready for survivor series so i asked if i'd like to transition into this and i think yeah 96 i was 36 and man my neck was already pretty well beat up so i said sure i'd like to and that was something i found once i once i started doing it i think it's something you find you either enjoy yeah. or you don't and there's times when you really love it and times when you really go oh my god so hey so and, but most of the time it's you really enjoy it. So and so, let's talk about you training Shane. How was that from the get go? <laughs> it was very cool, you know. Yeah. Shane. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I Shane. I can't thank you enough because your training helped him. Have, like one of his very first matches was versus me at WrestleMania, and you know the right. biggest stage ever, and we had twenty five minutes, and he brought it, and, and he and he did, <laughs> he did. his he did That's his Shane, part. Though. Yes, he did his you part. You can't help but love training him, man. Yep. You can't help but love training with him, man, because he doesn't stop. But like, so, but you know how he feels in there, right? He doesn't feel like any right. other wrestler you're in there with when you lock up with them, and you know. Right. Yeah, man, he's intense, but, but you man. Know he's, but you know he's there, and he lets yes. you know he's there. That's yep. the thing about him. You're right. He doesn't feel like any other wrestler you lock up with, but that's what makes him so freaking unique. Yeah, great. I think it's probably a lot like yeah. Vince. Did you did you help to train Vince as well? Yes, when that first the first match with Austin, yeah. I, and I would be there with Vince, wow. and he would want to train sometimes at eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, <laughs> and he would come to the ring, and he would be. I, I had no idea what they were going to do, so we would just lock up, and we would do hold for hold, and we would do stuff, and he would try to throw some punches, and you know how that <laughs> Yeah. <is. laughs> yeah. So I caught a potato yeah. here and there pretty much. So, but, but They look like cool shit, but at least they hurt because... like hell. <laughs> you what? They look like shit, but at least they hurt like hell. <laughs> oh, yeah, they hurt, man. Poor there. But, you know, that was cool, too, because um, he, he was – it was the first match he'd ever – been into and i thought well holy christ this is this is interesting yeah. and i remember him taking the uh we, we measured how far the table was from the the ring in the studio we because we, he was going to take the bump on the table off yeah. the cage and then you know he practiced it we put the bump pad down everything practice it and practice it and he got it he got it right in the studio and then when he took the bump um in the match if you notice he bounces yeah and he 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 bruised his back pretty good on that one, but you know he didn't shy away from it, man. No, neither neither one of those guys shy away from anything. Mm -mm. Well, I was wondering. No, neither does Steph. Right? Holy shit! I wanted yeah. to get your thoughts on intergender wrestling. Uh, you know what? Especially this day and age, I don't really have a problem with it. I think the women, uh, especially. I don't think I don't think they would have a problem with it either, and I could almost see it 
before I would say, and eh, not credible. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see it. My, I've changed my mind. I've changed my opinion so much over the last couple of years. I really, really have because the women today, if you, if you watch them, they're tough, man. It's not divas anymore. It's yep. really, they're really not. I mean, yeah. not that a lot of them ever were, but even more so today, I think they're capable. And, uh, and if you put them in against the guy and, and do the correct things and do what you need to do where it makes sense still, still, I hate to say this, but it's still male versus female. Sure. Uh, but when it comes right down to it, we know, I think all of us know there's a lot, a lot of women we wouldn't mess with no matter what. Well, not a doubt. <laughs> Jackie, you, you know, uh, Miss Texas, yes. for one. <laughs> Whoa! Yes! Right? Most definitely. I worked with her for a while, man. She was, uh, you know, in our stable or yeah. manager or whatever, man. And she was... She's still tough. Oh, yeah, man. Another yeah. girl you work with yeah. that was really tough was Sherry Martell. She was your manager when you guys were in the Heavenly Bodies. You got any stories you about her? You know what? Yeah. Well, uh, well, what a great lady. She actually, no, she actually took care of me when I broke my leg in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, man. We, and she, again, Sean, you know this better than anybody, too. She was one of the boys. She, yep. she was right there, man. She was a great, great lady. She was, she was one of the coolest people ever. But I broke my leg in Louisville. Actually, I, I didn't know it was broke. Uh, I got knocked off the uh, apron uh, one night in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, they have these, like, two flights of stairs. you got to walk down to the dressing room, and I, I could barely walk after the match. I was hobbling back. Well, I got back, and uh, I sat there for about 15 minutes because I didn't want to lace my boot yet, and I finally did and took a shower, and I was riding with uh, a couple guys, and we stopped, and I got beer, and I had, I don't know, whatever I had and I took that and we got back and we're all staying at this quality inner days in in Nashville and uh we got to go to work in Evansville the next night and I have somebody tape up my ankle I have it taped up from Wednesday to next Tuesday mm. and by next Tuesday my foot had become completely black oh god and uh Bill Dundee walked into the dressing room in Louisville as whoever was taping it up he goes you know what mate I think you might want to go to the doctor that looks like it's broke and sherry came in and says i'm coming to get you tomorrow uh her her roommate tina was a nurse and they took me to the doctor she came pick me up uh, sure as hell they x-rayed it and it was broke they put me in a cast right there she said come we're gonna get your clothes you're gonna come uh stay with tina and me we're gonna yeah. take care of you <clears throat> well tina had uh doctor scrubs the whole thing i sat there they they had dinner they had whatever else was available uh, from the <laughs> pharmaceutical side of things whatever whatever i needed that used to and be very I important about, yeah man I, I took about four pair of scrubs with me and that's how i became a doctor actually because i was wearing oh. a pair of those scrubs with uh robert fuller and jimmy golden going down to uh panama city one time and they they just did the they just did the angle on TV with this guy about being their doctor and they got to close the show with his big, his face and all this deal and everything else. And the FBI called looking for this guy the next week and, uh, <laughs> they had to scrap that angle until they saw that I had doctor pants. And that's how I became Dr. Tom Pritchard. So what are the differences so, and similarities in the way that you train guys and the way WWE wanted you to train guys when you were in developmental? Um, I don't think there's any difference really. And really, uh, at the time I was in developmental, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, direction except in the end, right. uh, they did say they wanted a curriculum. And that was something that I, <laughs> I respectfully said, that's not really how it works. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's no real way to go step A, B, C, D, because it's not, it doesn't happen like that. It's a feeling business in my opinion. Uh, and I have a curriculum now. I, I, I have it planned out. We had a curriculum back then. It just wasn't called a curriculum. We had a plan. We knew what we were going to do. But if you don't feel this, it's not going to come across as authentic yeah. and real. Mm-hmm. And if it looks good, you'll see it. If it sounds good, you'll, you'll hear it. If it's marketed right, you'll buy it. But if it's real, you will feel it. And everybody else will feel it too. And that's what we're doing in wrestling or sports entertainment. You're going out, and if people are watching a performance or a match, whatever it may be, it's a promo, whatever it is, 
and I, I double dog dare anybody to go watch Dusty Rhodes. Uh, uh, the the promo we're talking about, you know, uh, the, the common man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, any any road, any Dusty's promos, he felt it. And you feel it. You know it. Roman Reigns when he when he talked about leukemia. I mean, it's real. But even when he talks about you know, we blur the lines, but it has to come back to being real and yes. get emotion from people. So that's how I train people, and that's how I, I explained it. So if you're feeling something one day, you go with it. If it's not clicking, you don't. You, you move on. You try yeah. to get something else, and you come back to that issue. But you don't go A, B, C, D, E, because then in your matches, you're going to go A, B, C, D, E. Mm-hmm. That's the way I look at it. Well, so, it's kind of what's that's, that's, it's kind of what's going on a lot these days, anyway. <laughs> well, well, I mean, maybe know, it I shows, mean, right? It shows. I, look, I, I think I, I think that you, you the difference is you know when you're watching something how you feel yeah. about it. You know if there's something urgent. You know if there's something different. You know if there's something uh, dangerous about to happen. That's that that whether it's scripted or not, it, it's supposed to come off unscripted it's supposed yeah. to come off impromptu and th- some of the best impromptu stuff was scripted and rescripted and done over and over and over but it's the artists like that it's those performers who know how to go out and make it feel like this is happening now for the first time mm-hmm. that's the magic yes this. and and that's kind of how i teach that's what i teach it's not how you do the hold yeah it's what you do in between and it's what you do to make everything in that match or every every part of your performance means something watch the rock watch austin watch dx watch all the guys from the attitude era you not know, that today's era is any any worse it's just different yeah and and, it's a different crowds different mindset and i was just uh um, when you just said that it's the stuff in between the holes, these people, these guys will tell you. Uh, I say that constantly. Mm-hmm. I said the real money shit is the in, is the stuff they do in between the moves, because and I, and I tell people like, you know, even if you're a small like cruiserweight style high flyer, watch. If you want to study and, and 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 up your game, watch the guys that are over that are really over, but you can't understand why because you don't think they're any good right. in the ring. Well, watch what they're doing in between those shitty moves you think they're doing, and you might get a freaking clue. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why the other thing, real quick, I, I, I got to say this since you said that, because I watched a show two weeks ago here in Knoxville, and uh, I'm watching these guys. They do some great stuff, athletic stuff, yeah. and I was entertained by it. I was entertained by it. But in the end... It was what it was. It was it was the moves. It was no storytelling. Mm-hmm. They the story they told was we can do all these great moves. I get that, but what I'm what I teach and what I tell everybody is you start working the moment you walk into the building. Terry Funk worked the moment he actually left his house, or even yeah. before he left his house. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. Sometimes you never stop working. Yeah. That's that's what a lot of guys don't understand is you have to become. You're not a character. You're not playing a character. You have to become who that, that I hate the word character, but who that character is. Yeah. Okay, Razor Ramon was Scott Hall, but Scott Hall was Razor Ramon and vice versa, and they were the same guys. Eventually. They were the same guys yep. inside the ring and outside the ring. Eventually, and that's what happened, really, Tom. Eventually, that's what yeah. happened with Scott. Yep. Hmm. That's right. Right. So what's and the... I mean, you know, whether whether there's whether there's psychological whether the psychological issues there or not, that's it not here nor there. <laughs> the, you know what I mean. The yeah. point is that was his business. It's still his business. It is what it is, and uh, that's what makes a great performer because those kind yeah. of guys, you know, come along once in a lifetime. How do you, how is that with with, with you, uh, Tom? Like, uh, have you ever had any issues? But trying to figure out where Dr. Tom starts and Tom, and the regular Don, uh, Tom Pritchard, you know, you know what I mean? No, I was just high all the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, did, I, I really, I really thought, you know, it was like, um, I, I don't, I never was very social anyway. I guess it was something I, I'm still trying to figure out what happened in my childhood and maybe this way. Uh, but there's always something they say you have to look back and see why you became the way you were. Yeah, man. I just, I, I was always, um, skeptical, never trusted anybody yeah. and, and never, 
never had that. You have to have confidence, man. You've got to believe in yourself. And that was just one thing I never did, except I believed I was going to be a wrestler. And once uh-huh. I got to that point, and then other things came along, and I got got into the, uh, you know, I was tra- I started lifting weights with Mark Lewin when I was 15. Wow. I anything too. Wow, right. Mark Lewin, you know, man, so there, the purple so haze. my mind was. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, he still yeah, looks yeah. like so, that. I mean, I, and I just, I wasn't, I wasn't a very people person. So Dr. Tom was Dr. Tom. And when I got yeah. to be a heel, you know, Bill Watts is the guy who asked me if I thought about being a heel. And I said, every day. Yeah. I said, yeah, because you just come across like an asshole. I said, yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, I, I saw a match with you from, from, from Georgia Championship Wrestling the other day from like 1981 or something. 82, yeah. 82, yeah. Wow. So you made the rounds, yeah. man. Oh, yeah, hey, yeah. Tom. How? Well, that was, oh, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead with your no, thought. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, I really, really enjoyed when I would hear you do color commentary. And I was wondering uh, if if that had ever, you know, been something that you wanted to keep, that you wanted to do again. Well, let me let me just say this. I think it was uh, it was one of the wrestling magazines who said, Dr. or I wasn't a doctor then, it says, uh, Tom Pritchard, the insomniac's best friend. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they buried me on that, man. It, it, in commentating, and I did some for Metal and Jack up in WWE. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, it really is because, you know, you're really selling the product. You're selling uh, the next show, and I just want to talk about wrestling. And I wasn't, yeah. you know, I, I, I thought at one time I could do it, but, you know, as it gets more complex, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Well, I just enjoyed, you know, the stuff you did in, uh, uh, you know, Dallas for, for what was it, but it was in USWA. Oh, Dallas was different. Yeah, Dallas yeah. was different. I had and a the lot more Portland. Fun doing and, that. Yeah. and I, I remember uh, some of the stuff you did in Portland as well, and I just enjoyed it. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that because not too many people tell me that these days. And you know, it's, man, it's you know, so you know, Tom, I really enjoyed every single time I was in the ring with you because. We would go out there, and and I don't like. I know people like to go. Eh, we just went out there and called it in the ring, yeah. But a lot of those matches are the shits that people and and we had really good matches that we would just went out there and just did our thing, man. Even yeah. on TV, yeah, but that's, even that's on TV a couple of times. It's what? Even on TV a couple of times, and that's like not something right. that you usually want to do on TV. It's just that's how comfortable we were with you. Right. Well, and, and again, I think that being a lost art, it's it's hard to do that if you're not working every day yes. with somebody you trust and somebody to guide you. And and that's the way it used to be. Business has changed. Times have changed. But I still think there has to be a way. And maybe it's done in, in Orlando. I, I, I don't know for sure if they get an opportunity to go in there and just call it and have a leader and have a follower. Right. Um, I don't know. You know, but that that's really uh, – that's that's the way I learned. I'm not saying it's the only way to learn. I'm just saying that's that's one way to yeah. do it. And uh, that's one one thing I like. I, I do teach, and it will be part of this course we're coming up with mm-hmm. uh, about calling it, and having a leader, having a follower, and, and you're going to switch roles and uh, figure it out. Yeah, and a lot of that is just getting comfortable and doing that out there because, like, you know, it, it can be really scary going out there without a net. You know, when yeah. when you're used to having a net all the time, mm-hmm. and and man, things can go really bad out there. <laughs> and, and, but if you, but here's the thing, man. Think about this: yeah. if you have a good heel, and, and define good heel for me these days, I don't know. But if you have a heel who under, heel who understands what makes a match, and a heel who understands um, when when to get the heat, when to have the baby face come back, because that's that's pretty much how I listened to him. Yeah. I would tell me lay here for a minute we're going to get him just stop again it was a different pace a different time but it's the same principle uh you listen to a guy who's been in there a little longer than you have and understands the uh, psychology and understands crowds and the difference in in, in the crowds and uh, the difference in a tv match yeah so yeah that's that's just uh, i think it's far and few between these days and Tom, back and during that you know obviously before it was changed over to NXT and you were there it was FCW and Tampa you know of all the people of all the all the students and uh different people that came through there anyone you're surprised did uh did as well as they did or and is there anyone uh, in particular that 
you were like, damn, I thought they were going to do more. Uh, you know, one of the one of the guys that I was really um, happy for and impressed with was um, uh, Breeze. Um, Tyler Breeze. Tyler Breeze. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt. He Because he came in, <laughs> you know, he's, again, he's one of these guys, such a nice kid. And when you're too nice, you know what happens. I mean, and that's kind of what was happening to him until he came yeah. up with this this gimmick. And I was I was surprised that they let him do the gimmick, and I was surprised that they let him uh, do do what he's done with it. And just because I thought they were moving away from that, so that was a surprise. The rest of the guys like Rollins and Ambrose and uh, Gosh Roman Reigns. I mean, you could see it when those guys were there. Sure. So I, I don't think – and Ziggler, of course, um, w- would get start, or started and stopped. Started and stopped. Yeah. And now it looks like he's starting again, and he's, and he's pretty well on the way. So, uh, I mean, no real major surprises because you pretty much knew Seamus was another guy that you just looked at him and saw star, yeah. I think. Do you know so, who who, yeah, who took a while? Who took a while? And and I had my doubts about. And I actually told him this, like, um, so it's no big secret. I told him, hey, I was wrong about you. It was Big E, because he was down there oh, for Big a minute. E was, you're right. You know, four years you, he was you know down what? there. I remember because yeah, he he was he was there at the tryout with yeah. uh, tennis shoes that that came the bottoms came off, man, as he was running the ropes. Wow. So yeah, I was I was wrong about him too. Big E was another surprise. Uh, but again, Kofi. And Xavier, uh, they were they were pretty talented when they got there, man. And Xavier, like real quick, Xavier, um, and then I want to talk about the school coming, like you guys are, but uh, but Xavier, man, that kid just did not give up. You know, I mean, he he was he kept coming up with ideas, ideas. He just a brilliant guy, man, mm-hmm. and and he stayed the course, and and it's paid off huge. Well, one thing I, I really just want to say uh, is. You, you cannot do anything, not just in this business, but in life without confidence. And you have to have belief in yourself because nobody else is going to have it. Right. And that's one thing I learned the hard way, real, real. It took me a while. Yeah. But Xavier had it, and, and uh, Ziggler had it. He still has it. Uh, Drew McIntyre is a guy who, who I'm glad to see back. Yes. Who has found the confidence because he used to be a guy – like a little puppy dog sometimes, you know, yeah. and as big as he is, as talented as he can be, I don't think we've seen his potential yet. I mean, he's still, he's still climbing the mountain, but at least he's, at least he's on the climb and at least they're letting him climb and they're, they're helping him along the way this time. I think, Yeah. you know, he's going to get there himself, but he's, he's having help along the way. It doesn't help. It doesn't hurt to have yeah. Dolph by your side. It doesn't hurt to be involved in some of those high profile matches he has. So, I'm glad he's taking a serious step this time. And, and another guy real quick yeah. who has surprised me, and I'm glad to see um, uh, got a little shot, was, was Jinder Mahal. He worked his yep. ass off in the gym, uh, came in and changed things totally, and uh, took a new approach. So yeah. sometimes I know you have to be put on that back road and that back burner. I get that. But I think he's another guy who I hope, for his sake, will start fighting back again, yeah. as Drew did. Yeah, well, these guys, they, you know, um, you know, Drew took Drew took a break from WWE, and and, and you know, it just like or just like a Co- you know Cody Rhodes, he left and and bet on himself. Like, hey man, sometimes you got to do those things, and then you know you come back a, a much better and much more valuable player uh, to the to the company. Yeah, and and that's one thing that uh, once you get out there and you learn what the secret is to the game yeah. and, the, and the secret really is there is no secret yeah. it's it's just you have to bet on yourself and you have to believe in yourself and you have to have ideas because all it takes is just i'll never forget real quick sitting in a meeting uh, a creative a right believe this i was on the writer's team I, I didn't do much but but i sat in this <laughs> meeting and would hear events say well he said he could do it let's see if he can yeah and I thought, wow that's all it took just for the guy to come in and says give me this shot and let me do it well, you talk about how wrestling is a feeling art form, and you've guided so many massive careers in your in your career. The next step, obviously, is the Jacobs Pritchard Wrestling Academy, jpwrestlingacademy.com in Knoxville. Tell us about that. Well, this is this is something that uh, when Glenn first started running for mayor, uh, we had dinner one night, and he was just. 
I forget how it came up. Somebody said something about this guy has a wrestling school. He goes, what? Where at? Well, okay. We, we looked at it. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you think about doing a wrestling school here in Knoxville? And I said, not a chance. It's just there's too many local guys. There's too much uh, this independent stuff. Uh, I've tried it. It won't work. But this was two years ago. And um, so he asked me one more time. He says, what do you think about doing a wrestling school? I've got a garage over my house. He had a house in Dandridge. And uh, we went over and looked at the garage. And it was low ceiling, really small. He's got his gym next door to the garage. And, you know, I, I thought, well, I was kind of cramped in here, man, but we might be able to do it. And the more I thought about it, I said, no, there's just no, there's no way. We'd have to put a 16 foot ring in there and it just, it wouldn't work. It, it'd be cramped. It would be just like, it would be just like everything else around these little independent outlaw shows in Tennessee. And then all of a sudden the independent scene started really thriving and started getting a buzz. And a friend of mine here in Knoxville, Dennis, or Dennis, Devin Driscoll, he, he's, he teams up with Mick Drake and Booker's uh, Reality of Wrestling in Houston. He, he wrestles pretty much all over, uh, all over the place right now, too. He owns a place called D1 Sports out in Hardin Valley in Knoxville. And he's got a lot of room, great gym. Um, we were talking, and uh, he said, well, we could set up a ring here. And this would be a perfect opportunity. So I told Glenn about it. We went and looked at the, the gym. We said, yeah, let's, let's, let's do this here. Let's take a chance and uh, go ahead and open up a school. And it would be one of these things where it's not just for wrestling, but it's where you come to learn psychology. It's where you come to learn how to have fun doing what you're doing, but also be serious about the business and how to make it not just in WWE, but also on these uh, – other independent shows were a little more serious about about their shows. Uh, so that's what we have in mind. We're going to do uh, from 6 to 10. Uh, six, 6 to 7, the one-hour training with uh, Kyle Hayes. He used to train the guys in NXT in Orlando. And then we'll do three hours of wrestling training from 7 to uh, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, so just to make sure I got the times right. And uh, we're going to do five nights a week. We have a 20-foot ring, which is standard for WWE. And uh, so we'll be teaching everything you need to know for 16 weeks. And um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, How is this? You said the website is... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just wondering, uh, are we right now focusing on just beginners with no experience or are we talking about like anyone with any level of experience you can you can have uh, any experience you beginners or experienced guys because what i found out is if you have any experience especially around here or on the independent scene you have basic experience yes and do you know the basics can you can you show me mm -hmm. if anybody goes for a trial for ring of honor or wwe or any any other major let's say any any organization has a tv uh, or any major organization uh they're going to want to see if you can show us the fundamentals show them the fundamentals show them the basics can you lock up can you tell a simple story yeah it's great if you can flip flop and fly that's great but let's put it in the right places let's see what you can do first because if that's all you can do and you get lost in a match, then you're lost. Yeah. So they want to see what you can do, basics, fundamentals, and uh, tell a story. Nice. And that's what we'll teach. And first classes begin January 7th, 2019, but you're having an open house January 3rd, so people can go to jpwrestlingacademy.com for all information. Yeah, exactly. Nice. And uh, on January 3rd, uh, Glenn and I will be there to explain what we're going to do. Of course, Glenn is the mayor of Knox County, so he's not going to have a whole lot of time, but he will stop by periodically and check in. And uh, so he will be a part of it. Yeah. And uh, but but the majority of the training is going to be done by me. And uh, quite simply, I understand it's a wrestling school. And, and what can you learn five days a week? Well, 
come out and find out. It's it's not an easy business, and you're gonna, not going to learn everything in 16 weeks. But you'll learn enough to where we have connections around here, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, AM, AML. Uh, we have some connections in Atlanta, Cincinnati. So we can get you booked in this area, um, and you'll have the you'll have the fundamentals and basics down. If you happen to score a tryout or happen to be somewhere and somebody asks you uh, to do something and show us that you can tell a story, you'll you will be able to tell a story. Yeah, Glenn. Hey, just for anyone that doesn't know, uh, Glenn Jacobs is also a Malenko guy. So uh, you know he knows yeah. he knows uh, what a good. Uh, you know, wrestling st- school. Uh, so it's like, you know, he knows as well. There's, you know, this is, uh, I like this. Building yeah. the foundation. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. See, let, let me just, let me just go ahead and say this too, because we both understand, you're right. Glenn used to, uh, I think he would train two days a week because he was a bouncer at night and he would, he would train during the day. But, you know, we understand that if you're going to go to a wrestling school, you know, what are your goals? We want to find out what your goals are. Are you looking to get to WWE? Are you looking to get to Ring of Honor? Are you looking to just be on the independence and, and try and make a living? That's cool. That's fine. But it all revolves around the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have to know how to walk in the ring. You're going to have to know how to lock up. You're going to have to do the basic basics. And once you have that foundation, um, we can get you somewhere else. Glenn will tell you himself. Kane is not a technical wrestler. You're not going to see a whole lot of technical wrestling, but that's not what he needs to do. Early in his career was a different story, but there's stages and there's steps you need to take. So um, that's what we're here for. And that's what we're going to teach. Awesome. That's great. Hey, well, so do we give, give the information? Yeah, once again, jpwrestlingacademy.com. The open house is January 3rd, 2019. First classes begin January 7th of 2019, and they go through April 26th, 16-week classes, and all the information you can find at jpwrestlingacademy.com. And also, uh, Tom, uh, besides this, are you still uh, available for sa- sa- traveling around for seminars? I am. Yeah, we'll okay. do it on the weekends uh, because we have the weekends free, obviously. Here. And but so, yes, any yes, information on how we get a hold, how people can get a hold of you for that? Uh, they, uh, usually, you know, what's the, the best the best way to do that is uh, they've got me on Facebook. Yes, it's at Tom Pritchard, uh, or at, on Twitter. They've even uh, instant messaged me uh, or direct messaged me on Twitter. But Facebook has been the best way. But also, you can email me uh, at book Dr. Tom at AOL.com. I would highly suggest bringing uh, Dr. Tom in uh, because, I mean, um, they didn't just have him down there teaching everybody, you know, the Roman Reigns and, and different people like that for no reason. And I can I can vouch for the fact that he's an amazing uh, uh, guy to wrestle in the ring. And uh, and uh, Tom, I'm, I'm really grateful that you took uh, – Took some time to come on the show today and, and talk about all this. I could, I, there's so much more I want to talk about, but we're at the end of the show, damn. Uh, I got you. I got, well, listen, thank you. Thank you for having me on, man. When I text you, I, I really want to talk to you anyway, but I do appreciate it. And I uh, uh, hope to see you soon, man. I hope to see you soon, my friend. And uh, uh, thank you again, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Tom Pritchett, everybody. Yeah. All right. Cool. If you're a promoter in New Zealand or Australia, you should really look into booking him because it's his goal to wrestle or be there in those countries. Oh, so okay. that would be really cool for him and cool. for those promoters. All right. There we go. But also, follow Sean on media. Uh, follow Sean on social media <laughs> at the Real Xbox. Use the hashtag Xbox One Two Three Sixty. Um, you'll be at the Rhode Island Comic Con this weekend, November second through the fourth. Yep. And then follow me on Twitter at Jimbo in the booth. Awesome. You guys can check me out on Twitter and on Instagram at underscore Denise Salcedo. I have three shows this weekend, two with EWF and one with Ali Lucha. So go on Twitter, check it out. All the information's on there at underscore Denise Salcedo. Awesome. At Jay Quasto, I'm filming my comedy special Sunday, November 11th at the Brea Improv. If you're in Southern California, I'll give you free tickets. Otherwise, watch Championship Wrestling from Hollywood every single week. All right. Well, doesn't leave anything for me to say, so I guess I'll just say we'll see you right here next week on X-Pac 12360.
from executive producers Maria Manunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, Sean Waltman, producers Mark B. Donica, Jimbo Frank, and the entire Xbox 12360 staff. We would like to thank you for tuning in. Like us on Facebook, rate and comment on iTunes and YouTube. Follow XPOC on Twitter at the Real XPOC and email us at Xbox1236 show at gmail.com.